I'm about to make your life a lot easier in ways you didn't know were possible. I've got a bunch of different computer tips. A lot of them are specific to Windows, just some tips and tricks, but a lot of them are also general computer tips that you might not have realized were a thing. And I think for a lot of these, you probably have not seen anyone mention them before, so they should be new for most of you. Starting off with number one, this is one I use sometimes, and that is to add an exclamation mark to the front of file names or any other item name in a program where you want it to show up at the top of any alphabetical list. So for example, maybe you have a bunch of documents you want to list alphabetically in a folder, but you want a couple of them to be at the top, kind of like favorites. What you can do is simply add an exclamation mark to the front of it and it should show up first. And then you can use different ASCII characters like the at sign, uh, period, and a lot of times those will have a specific order too, so you can customize it a little bit more. This is also useful in programs that might not let you customize beyond alphabetical, but you want certain ones to show up. For example, this is kind of random, but in the color management settings in Windows, I have some custom color profiles and the only way to sort these is alphabetically and it shows all the built-in ones along with the custom ones, but I always want to get to the custom ones, so I put an exclamation mark in front of it and then they're at least all grouped at the bottom. It's in reverse alphabetical, but still. It makes it easier. Next up, number two, is another tip that I've used forever, and that is in the Windows Download folder, if it's not already set like this, right click and hit Group By and then Date Modified. Or you could also do Date Created, which I'll explain in a second, and if that doesn't show up, you can go to More and then find it in the list and enable it. It's pretty easy to see what this does. It basically groups together files that were downloaded today or yesterday or more than a few days ago. And this is useful to me because a lot of times you are only carrying about the most recently downloaded files if you're downloading something. But where it comes in handy is say you're downloading a bunch of files all at once and you want to find one of them alphabetically or just have it better organized, then you'll still be able to sort them alphabetically, but again, they'll be grouped with only the most recent ones together. And then the older ones will also be alphabetical, but separate. And then the other property that might be useful is the date created, whether you sort by or group by. And it's different from date modified because, well, it's the date the file was actually created on the file system. And this is self-explanatory why this might be useful. A lot of times you might need to make maybe a tiny change to a file, and then that kind of jumps it to a whole different part of the date modified list, which is usually what people use, but you do want to sort by when you actually downloaded the file or something like that. So just knowing about that, even if you just add it as a column, is pretty useful. All right, next up, number three, we have the Windows Expanded Context Menu. You probably know in Windows 10, if you right-click something, or in Windows 11, if you right-click and go to More Options, it brings up this style of context menu. But if you shift right-click something, whether in either Windows 10 or 11, it'll bring up an expanded version of this context menu and it'll show sometimes extra stuff depending on what you're clicking on. For example, if I shift click on a folder, here's a few options that weren't there before for open PowerShell window here, open Linux shell here, and open in new process. For files, it's gonna depend on the file type. For example, on an EXE, you can see this extra option here for run as different user. So if you deal with a lot of a certain file type in Windows, it might be worth it to try shift right clicking it and seeing if there's any options that you might find useful in the future, and then you can use it. Now, as a quick extra bonus tip, you can actually, in Windows 11, make it so it always uses the old context menu. You can change it via a registry edit. I'll actually put a link to a howtogeek.com article. They explain it in a lot more detail. They have like a registry file. You can just download and run it if you want to do that, which is like what I did. Now, one extra tip I have is a great way to stop sketchy online data brokers from selling all your personal info, not just to the highest bidder, but basically any bidder. But the way to stop it is today's sponsor, Delete Me, a data privacy service to which I myself have been a paying customer for over three years now, long before they ever sponsored. If you've ever Googled yourself, you definitely have seen the countless so-called data broker websites who not only collect and display all your personal information, like name, address, and phone number, but even sell it to companies to do whatever they want with it. But that's where Delete Me comes in. They do all the work for you in submitting removal requests on your behalf. New data brokers pop up all the time, so Delete Me is constantly adding new ones and continue to monitor them and repeat removals if your info shows up on the site again, which can happen a lot. At the moment, they automatically scan 99 data brokers and you'll get a privacy report for which sites you were removed from after seven days and every three months after that. 
so you can see exactly which sites are clean and which ones have removals in progress. But you can also submit custom requests to have specialists remove any data from hundreds of other sites, even surprising ones like berkeley.edu, for example. It's not even a data broker, but Delete Me will still help you get removed from it if you're on there for some reason. So if you want to get your personal information removed from the web and search results, go to joindeleteme.com slash theojo and use the promo code theojo for a nice discount. And with all that being said, let's continue. All right, on to number four. This is more of a general computer life tip, I guess. And that is if you were like me who had a big stack or file cabinet full of physical user manuals for different products you've bought over the years and you just keep the manual around just in case. Well, what I started doing is to actually either one, if you can find it online, find the online version of all the product manuals, or if you can't, actually scan them into a PDF and then save them all into one folder on your computer and throw out all the physical manuals. This has often made my life a lot easier. For example, if I want to look up the product manual, I don't have to dig through a bunch of piles of physical ones. I can simply search for it in that folder. I'll put the product name, maybe even the model number in the file name and just search for it. And it's a lot easier than searching physically. And on top of that, if you download the digital version or use optical character recognition on the ones you scan, you can often just search through the PDF for the term you're looking for, if you're looking for a specific problem to fix, instead of having to literally flip through the pages of the physical one and have to look in the table of contents to see if it even talks about the problem you wanna deal with, it's a lot easier. And of course, it saves a lot of space. All right, next up, number five, is a way to address an occasional issue I've come across in Windows, which is that by default, usually enabled in the device manager settings, is that Windows may power down USB powered devices if it's considered idle. For example, if you go in the device manager in Windows and right click a USB device and then go to properties and then the power management tab, a lot of times you'll see this option for allow Windows to turn this off when it's not being used. And in the past, this has caused issues with devices not working properly when I think it should. And I actually created a PowerShell script that automatically goes through all of these and unchecks that box basically. But another important thing to note about this is I believe, at least in the past, when you did a major Windows update, maybe even not a major one, it would actually reset this setting in all the devices, which is part of the reason I did the script, just so I wouldn't have to manually go through them every time. So if you do end up running the script, maybe every once in a while, go check to make sure that it's still disabled and Windows didn't reset it, and then you can just use the script again. I'll put the link in the description where you can go on GitHub and just download it. And then you can run it by opening PowerShell. I believe it has to be as an admin. You can use the command CD to change directory to wherever you have that file. And then because PowerShell is weird, you have to run the script by doing a period and then a backslash and then the name of the script, and then it should run. You might also need to run this command first, which will temporarily remove a restriction for Windows to block PowerShell scripts. Just make sure you include the dash scope process one. That makes sure that it will go back to the normal security setting after you close the window. I've seen a lot of tutorials that talk about PowerShell scripts that don't include that, and then you kind of leave your computer open afterwards, so definitely include that. Okay, I believe we're up to number six, and this one has to do with the terminal app in Windows, which is basically a more feature-rich version of the command prompt. It's like the new version of that. Anyway, usually when you right-click something, I don't know if this depends on how you have Windows set up, but you should usually see an open in terminal option, and that will simply open the terminal with the path that you right clicked in preset. So it makes it a lot easier than having to type in the path manually. But what you can also do if you need to run a terminal in admin mode, what you can do is actually go into the Microsoft GitHub page for the preview version of the terminal and install that alongside the regular version and then actually set that one to automatically go into the admin mode. So you can right click in a folder and basically choose whether you wanna run it as normal or admin. And the way you do that is open the terminal preview app and then go into the settings and then look at whatever the default profile is. In my case, I set it to command prompt. So I go into that on the left side and then you simply toggle the setting on that says run this profile as administrator. And then also make sure the option to start in parent directory is checked. That makes sure that it starts in that path that you 
right clicked from. And now you can easily open a terminal anywhere, either as regular user or admin in just two clicks. Up next, number seven is a couple ways to easily extract text from an image. One way is to use Microsoft's Power Toys suite of tools. This is published by Microsoft. You can actually get this from the Microsoft store, download from there. And I'm not gonna get into all the different tools in this. I've made videos about this, but specifically the one I'm looking for is the text extractor. You can toggle that one on, and then you can either use the shortcut, which I always forget, or you can click on the little icon in the system tray, and it'll bring up a menu of a bunch of different tools you have enabled. You can simply click on text extractor. It will bring up a cursor. You select what you wanna extract the text from in the image and it'll try to interpret it. And then you can paste it from the clipboard. Alternatively, the latest version of the snipping tool built into Windows also does text extraction. If you take a screenshot, highlight an area, you'll see this little box icon show up and you can click that. It'll analyze and find text and you can select some of it or all of it and it'll copy to the clipboard. And that might be useful because one might be more accurate than another. In some cases, you can try both. Okay, on to number eight is an easy way to get to the BIOS menu on your computer. You probably know that there's a BIOS key you can usually press either the delete key or the F2 key or something like that when the computer boots up and then it'll bring you to the BIOS screen. But doing that, a lot of times that just ends up with you pressing the key a whole bunch of times, booting up the computer, hoping that you time it right, or sometimes you might not even know what the key is in the first place. But you can actually create a shortcut in Windows to automatically restart the computer and go directly into the BIOS without having to hit any key. And the way you do that is to create a shortcut, so right-click, create shortcut anywhere, and then in the target box, you're gonna type in this command, cmd.exe slash k shutdown slash r slash fw slash t1. And I can break down what these all do. The cmd.exe slash k, that just means we're gonna be running this command through the command prompt and the slash k makes it so the command prompt window stays open after it runs so you can see what it's doing. The shutdown slash r is the command to restart the computer. That's what the slash r does. And the slash fw, this is actually the key here. This stands for firmware, and that's the one that makes it restart to the BIOS. Slash T, that stands for time, and that's just the number of seconds to delay before restarting. I just set it to one, so it's not necessarily instant, but that one doesn't really matter. And then all you have to do is simply double click on that shortcut, make sure you want to actually restart the computer if you do, and it will boot directly to the BIOS settings. All right, now the next three tips are really quick. These are just some keyboard shortcuts that are probably good to know. And for number nine, I'm gonna actually group two together. You have the control backspace and control delete shortcuts. And this simply allows you to delete an entire word instead of just pressing the backspace character by character. And the difference between backspace and delete key is the backspace goes to the left and the delete key deletes anything to the right, but it's still word by word instead of character by character. Next, number 10 is a quick, cool one. And that is if you have a window open, if you press Alt Escape, it will simply send that window to the back behind any other open windows. And for number 11, this is one that a lot of people see as common knowledge, but you might not. And that is in many, many programs, you can zoom in by pressing Control and then scrolling up and down. And this is, for example, in Google Chrome, but also a lot of other programs too. Okay, we're up to number 12, and this is a really cool tool that is built into Windows that most people don't know about, and that is the Quick Assist tool. And you can just find this by searching it in the Start menu. What this does is makes it really easy to connect remotely to someone's computer if they need help, whether you're the person that needs the help or giving the help. I'm not gonna get too far into this in detail. I made another video where I did, but the basics of it is you simply use a code that you give the other person, and then they're able to connect to your computer and do a bunch of stuff and you can watch what they're doing and it makes it a lot easier than maybe having to describe something over the phone that you're trying to fix. And I'd even say it's a bit safer than other remote desktop software like TeamViewer because this every time it's a one-time session so they can't keep reconnecting to your computer and also I think you can like kick them off easier. So it's a bit safer in my opinion. All right, now number 13 is another more general computer tip but also for a lot of devices. And you probably know that a lot of times if you need to fix something that's acting weird, simply turning it off and on again 
fixes it a lot of times, not just for computers, but a lot of stuff. But another good thing to know, this is the real tip, is it's often good to not just turn it back on right away, but actually wait like 30 seconds or up to a minute and then turn it back on. A lot of times you'll see instruction manuals that may actually say this and you might've wondered why. And that's basically because in the computer, you have stuff like capacitors or inductors that stay energized for a little while after the power is cut from it. And this might be powering memory chips that hold on to a bit of information that might be causing the issue one way or another. It might just be being weird. And if you turn off the thing and keep it turned off, for long enough, usually about a minute at most. That's just an extra way to make sure that really everything gets totally reset, even at the physical level. And sometimes that can help when otherwise just turning it off and on again immediately might not. All right, we still got a few more. We're up to number 14, and that is enabling Windows long file paths. So not a lot of people know about this unless you're like a Windows power user, but Windows actually has a maximum file path length of 260 characters. I'm not talking about a file name. I mean that the entire path, including all the folders leading to that file, including the file name, can only be a maximum of 260 characters, which means if you use a lot of deep folders, then you could run into a problem where you can't create a file or rename it to something too long. You can just run into issues, but you can actually change a setting in Windows that expands this to like 30,000 characters. So effectively unlimited. There's a couple ways to do this. One is a bit easier than the other. If you're on Windows Pro Edition, this is a lot easier. You simply go into the group policy editor and then go to computer configuration, administrative templates, system, file system, and then on the right, look for enable Win32 long paths and change that to enabled. If you're on Windows Home Edition, Microsoft has an article, which I'll link to in the description. And in there, they have a PowerShell command that you can run. So just look for where it talks about enabling the long paths. Look for this command, hit the copy button, and then open PowerShell by searching in the start menu, running it as administrator, paste it in and run it, and that should enable it. Okay, number 15 is a couple ways to find hidden launch parameters in certain programs. Everybody already knows that if you double click on an exe file or a shortcut, it will open the program. But another way you can technically do it is to open a command prompt to that location and then type in the name and run it that way. It does the same thing, but it's just another way. And the reason you might wanna do this is because a lot of times programs also have launch parameter options, where if you do it through the command line, you can add these additional options that might change how the program behaves. And these, a lot of times, are usually gonna be documented in like the help articles or whatever, but sometimes there are launch parameters that are not documented anywhere necessarily. So what you can do to find these a lot of times is Maybe go to your favorite program, and then if you type in the command prompt, the name of the exe, and then add stuff like slash help, or dash help, or two dashes, and help, or another common one is slash question mark. A lot of times this will list out a bunch of the command options and descriptions of them. And other times, even inputting invalid parameters will help. For example, here's a file from Camtasia, it's a screen recorder, and this particular file, if you type in dash help, it'll specifically say that's not a valid thing and then show a window with all the possible ones. And I don't believe these are listed anywhere. So it's maybe good to know about if you wanna look for hidden parameters, you can try just invalid ones in addition to the dash help. Just be aware that for some programs, it's very possible that it won't show anything if you type in an invalid parameter. So don't expect this to work all the time, just sometimes. Okay, got a couple left. And for number 16, it's to increase the log size for the Windows Event Viewer log. This is more for power users, but if you've ever used the Event Viewer log to look up error messages and stuff like that, what you can do is go to Windows Logs, it expand these. These are probably the most main ones you're gonna be looking at. And for each of these, right click and go to properties and look for the maximum log size option. For some of them, the default is gonna be 20 megabytes. So like 20,000 kilobytes. But I would personally expand this to like 100 megabytes or more. It's really not that much space and it allows for much larger logs and just keeping track 
of way more stuff before everything gets overwritten and deleted. Now, you might look at this list and scroll all the way down to the bottom and say, well, look at this, the default, it's already going back like six months. Why do I need it to be even longer? But when this might come in handy is if you have some kind of issue that starts generating a whole bunch of error messages, and then it kind of takes up the whole log and starts overwriting everything else. For example, this security log, I don't even think these are necessarily errors or problems. It's just, there's a lot of stuff that gets logged here, and you can see this only goes back a day on the 20 megabytes. Just keep in mind, you do have to do this for each individual log file, and there are a lot more possible logs that you can look through than just these, but if you're a more advanced user and you're looking through those other ones, you probably know which ones you want to increase the log size for anyway. And finally, for number 17, this is another simple one in Windows, and that is to change the user account control to the strictest setting. And you do that by searching user account control in the start menu, clicking that, and then just putting the bar all the way up to the top, and then hit OK. This is the thing that pops up a box when you do anything important, it says. But if it's at the top, basically it'll run and double check anytime you run anything as an administrator. Now, to be clear, this is not like a bulletproof virus protection strategy or anything. It can usually be bypassed by a virus that knows what it's doing, but it's just an extra little layer of security, or at the very least, it's a way to simply know when you're gonna be running something that wants admin privileges just a little bit better to know about, a little bit extra security. And so that's it. And also let me know if there's any computer tips that I did not mention that you think are good to know. And also check down there. Someone might have left a comment with a really cool tip that I didn't. Thanks again to Delete Me for sponsoring. And again, if you want to have your personal info removed from data brokers, go to joindeletemecom slash Theojo and use the promo code Theojo for a discount. If you enjoyed this video, give it a big giant thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. And if you want to subscribe, I try to make videos about twice a week, usually Wednesday and Saturday. And if you want to keep watching, the next video I'd recommend is where I talked about the most useless Windows folder ever, that 3D objects folder that you might remember from Windows 10. What was the deal with that? I explained that in this video. I'll put that link right there. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.